<laughs> I'm looking for my friend. <laughs> Kimberly. I think all I ever wanted to do was be funny. That was my ambition, was to just be funny. I'm going to see you. The one performer I really remember seeing on stage was Joyce Grenfell, and I was about six or seven. Children, now free time is over, so put away your things. And... What struck me about that was that she was a woman standing on stage on her own, and I think that did have a massive, massive influence. Neville, stop being a train, dear, and come and sit down. <laughs> well, get into the station and then sit down. <laughs> George, George, don't do that. <laughs> if I'd not seen her, I don't think it would have occurred to me that that was a possible career, that you could just stand on stage as a woman all by yourself. Oh, just don't get this. <laughs> would you mind not to get me? <laughs> I think my main plan that my parents had for me was to leave home, which I did. They didn't have any plans for me. We weren't that sort of family. <laughs> we didn't talk about things like that. We all lived in separate rooms. And all I wanted to do was just go to university and really act. So I applied to the Manchester Polytechnic School of Physics, which was a really good drama school at the time, and I applied to really crummy ones that I think have been made into car parks now, I hope. And I went to the one in Swiss Cottage in London, and I read my poem and did my Shakespeare, and someone said to me, oh, the problem with you is you've got a deformed jaw. And I said, oh, have I? She said, yes, you can't say yes properly, and um, you'll never work. I said, oh, and I had to go, and that was me. <laughs> Thank you. I auditioned for Manchester Poly, and I was 17. I was in the last year at school. I remember it really, really well, because it was so important to me. I've never been so nervous about anything in my whole life. And all day we were being led from room to room by this girl with a clipboard. And she had a huge mop of hair and these tiny, tiny little eyes and tons of eye makeup, more eye makeup than you think you could get on an eye. And she was very funny and she was talking to all the students and the parents and just talking about how she was a nurse and she was doing impressions of herself wheeling a commode up and down a ward. And I thought, God, she's really, really funny. What a personality. That chance encounter was eventually to change the course of British comedy history because that really funny former nurse was none other than Julie Walters. But Manchester Polly turned Victoria down, so it would be a few years before Wood and Walters would meet again. Meanwhile, Victoria did get a place at Birmingham University, which led to an opportunity to audition for New Faces. New Faces was shot in Birmingham at ATV, and one of my friends was uh, a makeup girl on New Faces. And New Faces was massive. People used to think then if you could get on New Faces, that would launch your television career. And I turned up to audition for it. It was a huge queue. This was the first thing in the morning, a huge queue of people. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to get seen. But because I had my friend, my makeup girlfriend, Louise, she took my application form and she put it to the top of their pile on the desk where the producer was sitting. So I did get seen that day, otherwise I would never have got on. You're a star, superstar, on you go with your finest star. Please welcome Victoria Wood. There's a tin in the office cupboard Labelled Lorraine Because I've gone and got engaged again My mother never watched the telly. She absolutely never watched it. And my father would only watch it standing up as if about to leave the room. So my father probably would have watched me on New Faces, but she wouldn't have. And to tell you the truth, I don't know what I can do instead. I won my first round. A very high score, I seem to remember. Something like 118 out of 120. But I remember Clifford Davis watching me and saying, well... You know, she's a cabaret act and there is no such thing as sophisticated cabaret, so she'll never work. I thought, oh, bloody hell, you know, I've got a deformed jaw and now I'm sophisticated cabaret. What chance have I got? I'll never, ever make a living. If you go on this egocentric uh, trip, you've got to accept the knocks as well as the praise. Following New Faces, Victoria was asked to appear in a comedy review at the Bush Theatre in London's Shepherd's Bush and write a sketch for the show. Meeting her fellow cast members was to prove a pivotal moment in her life. There was this girl called Julie, and we stood at the bar downstairs in the pub having a sandwich, and um, 
She just said something about being a nurse, and she said something about being in Manchester Poly. And I suddenly looked at her, and I did that sort of terrible thing of two faces going into one. And I said, ah, I know who you are. And she looked at me, and she said, well, I know who you are. She said, you're that girl in that green cardigan that didn't get in that day. And, and it was like we were sort of linked together. It was really odd. It was the first time I'd written a proper sketch that was properly performed and done and worked and got laughs. It was the first time I really felt I'd sort of found my own voice as a writer. Somebody saw that sketch and asked me to write a play. Well, during the 70s, my husband, Peter Eckersley, was head of drama at Granada. And uh, as head of drama, he used to scout around for things to go to, to put on the box. He came home one night from the Crucible Theatre, Sheffield, and said, I've seen this wonderful girl. She's absolutely fabulous in a play called Talent. You know, not all television people will go, go to the theatre. Sometimes, you know, people have to come to them. But he was out and about because you know, he was quite a special person and he saw it and uh, he thought he could make something of it and bought it for television. The moment that meant the most to me was when I saw the opening shot of Talent, which was a close-up of Julie looking through a bus window with rain coming down the window. And to think that that was something I'd written, it was very special. They've all had it done in our street. What? Having your insides out. What me nan will call your doings. Man next door says it's like waving a woody in me, Albert Hall. <laughs> I don't know how we got onto that. I only went round to borrow his second to us. <gasps> What's a woody? Nearly a happy ending picks up a few years after talent, and I think Julie's married and not in a very good marriage, and Maureen's reached target weight at Weight Watchers, and she's a bit more confident. Maureen's been coming here faithfully for quite a few months now. She's made a lot of friends. I know quite a lot of us are grateful for her recipe, Slimmer's Pro Feet Rolls. <laughs> and tonight, she is on target. Oh. Oh, well. They had a song, and the people from Weight Watchers all sang to her. Ladies. Peter Eckersley had a massive impact on me. I wouldn't have the career I have now, I don't think, if I'd not met Peter. I just needed somebody to spot what I could do, and he was right behind me. He just thought she was the most wonderful writer and writer of comedy. He used to say that if you ask Vic for a joke by tomorrow, she'd come in with 15 wonderful jokes, which is really, really hard to do if you've ever tried to do it. And he thought of um, the title Wouldn't Walters, because we was going to do this sketch show with Julie. Come in. We just came around to say it was a really great show tonight, really smashing, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, come in, girls. Are you not busy? I'm never too busy. To see the fans who put me where I am today. We're the groupies, <laughs> aren't we? Yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> We're like, uh, you know, we do everyone that comes here, because it's like our hobby, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, what sort of things do you normally do? Well, whatever they ask for. We're like versatile, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> well, Wooden Walter suffered by the fact that Peter died in between the pilot and the filming of the of the series. So what it would have been if Peter had still been alive, I don't know. I'm in lessons, are you? Professor Hartley. Oh, yeah. Should ask for a refund? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just do a quick check on the computer. Colour of eyes? Blue. Grey. Hair? Blonde. Mousy. <laughs> I tell you what. They're looking for someone down the snug at the Winston, you know. <laughs> yeah, good job. Five pounds a night plus any plowman's left over from dinner time. <laughs> Living together is great. Living together is like Popeye and spinach. Puts air in your chest. It's like passing your test. I'm very impressed. It's fairly splendid. It's recommended. Oh, living
Duncan Preston was brought in to play the male lead in the third play I did at Granada, which was Happy Since I Met You. I'm quite a happy little person, really. And I don't want a one-night stand or a big, heavy relationship. Did everyone get that? I didn't quite catch the first bit, but jolly well said. The thing I remember about that film is that I was working with a very, very good actress called Julie Walters. Don't bloody patronise me just because I haven't got an equity card, a mouthful of tax-deductible crockery and what is laughingly known as a widgie. And I was working with a writer, Vic, who knew not only how to write funny lines, but how to write pathos. I'm sorry I smashed your new radio. It's OK. I tried to retaliate with your Christmas present, but it's very hard to smash a woolly jumper. Victoria, of course, continued to write TV plays and sketches for herself and her growing troupe of talented players. But she had also become one of Britain's finest solo comedians, leading to a prestigious invitation from ITV to make an audience with Victoria Wood. The Royal Variety Show a couple of years ago, they put me in the same dressing room with Frank Carson, Stan Boardman, Bernard Manning and Angela Rippon. <laughs> I God, she knows some filthy jokes. <laughs> The worst thing about doing an audience with is not that the audience is famous, because it really doesn't make any difference, but that you can see them, because it's a television show and they have to be lit. And I really never want to see my audience. And that was the biggest trial for me. That and the fact I was six months pregnant, my legs were aching, standing up that long. But it was, it was really good fun. Everybody in my class was enormous. They had to stop us doing cross-country running because we dented a viaduct going on the <laughs> So everybody was on a diet the whole time, and we thought that yoghurt made you thin, so we used to eat yoghurt all the time. And we used to say, Sandra, if you're going up to town, get the raspberry yoghurt. <laughs> then we've got raspberry, get somewhere else. <laughs> she used to come back and say, I couldn't get your raspberry yoghurt. Forgot your meat potato pie. <laughs> The first time I went to the Albert Hall, there was about eight or ten of us that had been working with her, and we were really nervous for her because, you know, I mean, we look around and there's people everywhere you look. And she came out, she just started talking like I'm talking to you now. If I was a proper celebrity, I'd have to have at least four children, one naturally, two adopted, one from sperm sent in by a well-wisher. <laughs> And I'd call them Pinky Perky, Monosodium Glutamate and Satsuma. <laughs> Nobody knew then, of course, that she was going to fill it for however long it was, 13 days or something, and then extend it. I don't think Frank Sinatra did that. Why the people who work in health food shops have always got styes... <laughs> ..and impetigo and psoriasis and scurvy and rickets. They're always the most droopy-looking little people, aren't they? The men always look like they're saving up for a sex change and they've only got 22 quid. And... Without ITV, I'd have to strip away half of my career, really, cos I can't take away what New Faces did for me, what Peter Eckersley did for me at all. They're, they're really crucial building blocks. Meeting Peter, it just seemed to be the right person at the right time to give me that confidence. He would have loved what's happened to her. Loved it. <laughs>